So let's move on to Roddy Edmonds. Thank you, Gail. And thank you everybody for being so kind and gracious. And if you need, have other questions, just email me. Uh, about the documentary. The settings is the Ardennes. And I know you all teach to the Holocaust and I'm assuming you teach to World War II. And what I've learned is that many American teachers do not teach to the Battle of the Bulge. You'll do Pearl Harbor, you might do the Bataan Death March, you do the bombing uh, to end the war in the Pacific, and you do some of the war in, in, in the um, uh, European theater. We're in the Ardennes, it's the heavily wooded area in Eastern Belgium that stat straddles the Belgium and the German border. It is the Battle of the Bulge, which is the largest land battle ever fought by the United States military until today. It is the largest battle offensive we have ever uh, conducted. 1944-45, it was a bitter cold winter. The time is December 1944. You're going to meet a young soldier, 24 turning 25, from Knoxville, Tennessee. Master Sergeant Roddy Edmonds, a man who had never met a Jewish person before he went into the army. And you will see a man of courage, conviction, and honor. And he's a true American hero. And the file footage is accurate. It's from places mentioned in the documentary. And so some things for our students to be, to be on the lookout for, as well as our teachers, we're gonna see the Siegfried Line. The Siegfried Line, also known as Dragon's Teeth, were triangles, were cement triangles. That's why they got the expression tri uh, dragon's teeth. And they were built by the Germans to withstand the advance of tanks. You will see them in the original file footage and you will see them in the file footage that we took when we went on site with Pastor Edmonds, Roddy Edmonds' son. Pastor Edmonds is a Southern Baptist pastor from Marvel, Tennessee. When you see Pastor Edmonds standing in an indentation, that's a foxhole some 75 years later. So without further ado, I turn it over to Irvin and Morgan and Professor Rosenthal, footsteps of my father, which by the way, won numerous awards and qualified for the Academy Awards the year it came out. If I may, before we begin, and Irvin's getting ready, several of you, um, misunderstood the time of our workshop, meaning we're on Eastern Daylight Time. So I'm getting some questions in the chat about our Holocaust survivors that were joining us today. And I will repeat the announcement that we said in the beginning that um, we knew weeks ago, which those of you that uh, registered prior to the past uh, day or so, Betty Gerpinchikov had a schedule conflict you're all going to be receiving her book. Um, yes, another example of rescue is those Jews that were able to go to Shanghai, China uh, after, uh, you know, around 1938, 39. And um, Betty will be joining us in October. Uh, and uh, the person that was supposed to be with us today, Moa Dami, who's an example of rescue, in the Netherlands, um, had a last minute conflict and couldn't be with us today. And so we extended um, our friend, our colleague, our historian about a rescue, Stanley Stahl. And um, so Maud will be joining us, but at another time, but all of you will be receiving her book. Thank you. No one can realize the horrors the infantry soldier goes through. If a man lives through a major engagement, he isn't much good after that. He gets scared, and I mean scared. And don't let anyone tell you that he wasn't scared. The infantry soldier takes a beating. I think he deserves more credit. But then again, 
Who am I? Master Sergeant Roddy Edmonds, 106th Infantry Division, 422nd Regiment. My father passed away in August of 1985. I was 26 years old. You know, my father, he never really talked about his experiences in World War II or his time as a prisoner of war. When I would talk to him about that and ask him, he would say, son, there's some things I'd rather not talk about. While my father was a prisoner of war, he kept a diary. He actually kept the diary prior, just prior to being captured and then following. A lot of things I'm not going to write because they're not exactly nice to talk about. I know God was with us and he answered our prayers. I learned men even better than before. Some were good, some were bad, some were better, some were worse. He says in his diary, he said, I don't want to talk about it, I want to get back. And I know friends and family are going to want to know what happened. So he felt like expressing them in written word would be the best way to share his thoughts and his feelings and by and large keep a record of it. But he would never pull it out. He would never show it to people. He would never ask anybody to read it. So it was kind of a, a hidden, hidden experience in his life. Late one night after reading his diary, I, I googled his name and rank, and the first link that came up was an article in the New York Times. I was being interviewed by the New York Times in 2008, and I just suddenly said, and there was a Master Sergeant Roddy Edmonds who saved my life when he defied the German commander in a POW camp. It was always inside me, but I, I had never talked about it with my family. It just coincidentally, a few months later, Chris Edmonds was trying to find out more about his father. In the uh, middle of that article, Lester mentioned the bravery and courage of his Master Sergeant Roddy Edmonds. He was facing the enemy at the risk of his life, and what he did was to save us, thought only of his men. That takes courage. But that was Roddy. A hidden fact of incredible heroism and bravery that could have largely gone unnoticed, that was indelibly written in the lives of these men and their children and their grandchildren and now their great-grandchildren. And I said, I got to find out what really happened to my dad during his POW experience. So it's been an incredible journey to open up the truth of history and uh, see it not only in the life of Lester, but see it in the lives of these other men. And they all have their own personal story, their own personal experience here on these hillsides, but they're all bonded together in, in the unity of, of love and friendship and war. It, forever bonded them together. I was born in the Bronx on August 8, 1923. We were a Jewish family, a happy Jewish family. January 27, 1924, I was a twin. I had a twin sister. We were born together. I was last one out. I was born in Cleveland on April 24, 1924. My real name is Irwin Fox. I should confess that. And I was born on June 17, 1925 in Brooklyn, New York. I got the draft notice shortly after I turned 18, and I reported in for the draft exam, and they found me totally acceptable. I was breathing. I was 18 years old. I was assigned as a combat medic to care for the wounded soldiers on the battlefield. I was in headquarters company of the 422nd Infantry Regiment of the 106th Division. And that's where I met Les Tanner. I was a 19-year-old recruit. Most of us were green. We were kids. I mean, we were really young pups. But there was a cadre of officers and non-commissioned officers. And Roddy Edmonds was the master sergeant of the headquarters company where I was sent. 
And basic training consisted of preparing us for combat. And Roddy was our instructor. And you could sense that this was a man of courage. Roddy grew up in Knoxville, Tennessee. He probably never met a Jew in Tennessee when he went into the Army. My dog tag had the information out of my name and my serial number, and the letter H for Hebrew, as all other religions would have carried identifications for their religion. And that was to help identify the burial process that you were put into the right kind of grave. One of the things we were told that if we were captured, we should destroy our dog tags. Because being a Jew in that circumstance, we didn't know what our future was. And off we went to the front. We went over as replacements for filling up the slots that had been opened by casualties. We were thrown right into the battlefield. The bombs started dropping. In 24 hours, we were changed. We were a different person trudging up this long hill to where we were going to be in place. And down the other side of the hill came the guys with bandages on their heads, and the wounded walking back. I did not have a unit designation until when I joined the 28th Division up in the Hurtgen Forest, which was not a good place to be. That was the worst of the worst. The shells would go up, hit the tree, and spread the shell so it could kill you half a mile away. We were in the middle of the night, snow covered, slit trenches, and I got into my trench. I had to take out the frozen body of a soldier. Oh, I think we were there five weeks. That was hell. Every day we woke up, we didn't know we'd make it the next day. The Army decided to pull the 28th out of the Hurtgen Forest. We were moved into a town called Hosingen in Luxembourg, which was about a mile west of the German front line, which was quiet. And there we stayed uh, right through till December 16th. I went overseas in September 1944. And I was Sergeant Lester Tannenbaum of the headquarters company of the 4 and 22nd Infantry Regiment. Early in December, all of a sudden we're on wheels heading toward the front. The weather was terrible, snowy, cold, wet. The next thing I know, we are outside of a little city called St. Vith. It was a 20 mile wooded area and we were defending that area. What would end as the greatest pitch battle ever fought by American troops, the Battle of the Bulge, would burst without warning on a quiet sector in the First Army Front. In December 1944, it was held in the north by the 2nd and 99th Divisions, by the veteran and exhausted 28th to the south, and by the newly arrived 106th, thinly spread at the center. The 106th Division, a brand new, young, inexperienced division, was relieving the 2nd Infantry Division in an area called the Schnee Eifel on the German border. This area was considered a quiet sector, a rest area where the 106th could become acclimated before seeing any fighting. When we went up to the front, we thought this was going to be easy. It was a rest, you know, nothing was happening. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Oliver Patton. In December of 1944, I was a second lieutenant in an infantry company of the 106th Division. The division went into the line and straddled the German-Belgian border about the 9th of December, 1944. Looking back on it now, I think probably the division was just about as green as I was, and you couldn't be much greener. I was a second lieutenant just out of Fort Benning. We replaced the second division company by company on the front right in the Siegfried line. We were among the first troops into Germany proper. We were on the German side of the border. We were very vulnerable. This is the place where the 422nd was encamped. 
near the front lines of the Battle of the Bulge. I'm here retracing the steps of my father, Master Sergeant Roddy Edmonds of the 422nd Regiment of the 106th Infantry. The men had come and were told that this was a quiet sector. And when they got here, just six days after they got here, uh, the war came to them. Early on the morning of December 16th, in this supposedly quiet sector, American soldiers suddenly found themselves hit with an immense artillery barrage, landing in all sectors, including the town of saint vite The first day of the attack was December 16th. St. Vith was being attacked. That's our division headquarters 10 miles in back of us. We were there when the Germans broke through with the Battle of the Bulge, and they broke through in force with all their panzers and their troops. I awakened and heard shell fire plowing into the town and whistling overhead. The Battle of the Bulge had begun. More than 50 German columns were now attacking through the Ardennes. To the south, the German attack had split the 28th Division. Now we were isolated. And the captain said, we're going to come out at 11 o'clock with our hands held up. Oh. Paul Stern got captured in that same movement. They were resting from having been in battle for a while. And while they were in rest camp, they were captured. We had no idea the Germans were anywhere near. They came up through the woods. So we were the first ones they took. From the east, battered remnants of the 106th fought their way back toward friendly territory. We held out for two days, and the Germans paid dearly. We also lost men. Our position was untenable, and we finally decided to make a break for it. If you'll notice the trees on the far ridge, that's where the 422nd was encamped. And so Dad and about 15 vehicles broke out of there, and they turned and, and made it down this road and were heading what they thought was for safety. We were trying to escape in our vehicles when we were hit with uh, 88 artillery. And we are cut off and surrounded by columns of German tanks, troops. We're outnumbered vastly outnumbered. Captain Forster said, it's hopeless. At the end of the 19th of December, to avoid mass slaughter, we surrendered. The forlorn and helpless feeling that came over me can't be described. It was a hopeless cause in our case. When Captain Foster surrendered us, he did a very wise thing. We had time to destroy everything. That's when I destroyed my dog tags. When we were captured, many of the Jewish POWs threw away their tags, and I decided I was really a little pessimistic about what the Dickens was going to happen. And I decided to hold on to my dog tag so I could be identified. Were the Germans going to shoot us? There had been times at Malmody where the Germans executed the prisoners. And out we came to become part of what was the largest collection of captured GIs in World War II, something over 7,200 of us from the 106th, from the 28th, and others. We began to start our march to we didn't know where. There was a concern that the Germans would just shoot us up. When you're in brutal hands, like the Germans were, you're scared as hell. I particularly was concerned because my name was obviously Jewish. So we started that walk, and it lasted for three days. And along the way, there was no water and no food. And then we got to the railhead, Gerald Stein. 
And that's where they were accumulating the 106 as well as the 28th, and uh, that's the first time that mix was beginning to be seen together. It was an uh, open air encirclement, barbed wire, enormous. That night, we again uh, slept outdoors. Cold, snow was on the ground, freezing, waiting for what was to come next. They loaded us on boxcars. They put 80 of us in the Greek car. We were packed like sardines, no food or water. We couldn't sit down, we couldn't lie down. We had to stand up. That was the start of our long journey to the first prison camp. Thursday, 21 December, 44. We were herded into boxcars and started deep into the heart of Germany. So the boxcars we were in turned out to be exactly the same cars that were taking the Jews to concentration camps. There were only four openings, two on each side at the top that were barbed wire, but oh, that's the only place light came in. It was very cold. Fortunately, I was dropping right near the entrance where the fresh air came in. There was a crack in the wall, and so I survived with the fresh air and we went further into Germany. A week after the Ardennes offensive had begun, the weather suddenly cleared. Allied air reconnaissance and bombardment was now possible. Prisoner trains didn't have any priority. The military trains had priorities. Every time a military train came along, we were shunted off to a siding. So we would go somewhat and then we'd stop, and we'd go somewhat and we'd stop. We ended up on a siding on a Saturday night in Limburg, Germany, and we're in a railroad yard, and there's nothing to distinguish or mark us, and British planes come over at night and bomb the hell out of that yard. <laughs> railroad yards were prime target. They didn't know that prisoners were sitting there and the bombs were falling. We had all been under fire and we knew how to take cover when you're under fire. But there was no way to take cover. You were locked into the Sparks car. And you can hear bombs coming down. They whistle, they go and then they explode and we heard those things whirring down. And of course you hear them coming down and you're helpless. I heard a lot of praying very loud. I have never prayed as I prayed there. It seemed as if each bomb was coming directly at our car. Several of the boxcars on our train were bombed with many guys killed. And luckily for me, I was not on those trains. I ended up the next day being shuttled to Bad Orb. Arrived Camp 9B, Monday, 25 December, 44. Master Sergeant Roddy Edmonds and thousands of American POWs were unloaded from boxcars and marched through the streets. And going through the lovely little town of Bad Orb, children are singing Christmas carols, lights are out, and all I can tell you is we're grim as hell. They were forced to march five miles up a mountainous road full of ice and snow. As we climbed the mountain to go into the camp, we were eating the snow. We hadn't had any water or food. The men marched right past this building, the headquarters for the Commandant Stalag 9B, on Christmas Day, December 25, 1944. All we wanted to do was get inside where hopefully it was warm and there was food, but we had to register. You have to do that because that's what gets back to your parents when they send the information about being a prisoner. So I drew this guy and he said, okay, name, rank, serial number. But then they start asking questions about your religion, and that is not 
a question I had expected to hear. Now, for the first time, I had to confront that. What the Germans made up their minds to do, and what they did, is they segregated the Jewish POWs. I was only there a few days when they announced on the loudspeaker that all Jewish American prisoners would fall out in the morning, and if they didn't, they would be shot. And we were assigned to the Jewish barracks. Special barracks surrounded by barbed wire within the prison. We were in a prison within the prison. Before us, before our, we were captured, they had never done this with the POWs before of Jewish origin. That's why none of us was aware it might happen. And so the Germans come to pull them out of the barracks. Dad sees his friend, Lester Tanner, leave with those men. Jewish moved out Thursday, 18, January 45. Uh, you know, the spirit of those soldiers was remarkable. I mean, we talked about our Jewish backgrounds, our family, mostly about food, because we were always hungry. When they decided some weeks later to ship us to a second prison camp, they took all the sergeants and corporals, all the non-commissioned officers, whether they were Jewish or not. And luckily I am taken out of that isolated place at Bad Orb, and the next thing I know I'm on a train going to Ziegenheim. The Jewish enlisted men who were left behind in Bad Orb were sent to Berga, a German concentration camp. They were in the mines in Berga, working without much food, 10, 11 hours a day, purposely to kill them. And many of them died there. And they didn't care about working Jews to death. That was part of the final solution anyway. Thursday, 25 January, 1945. Left Stalag 9B. Arrive Stalag 9A, Friday, 26 January, 1945. So we arrived at Ziegenhain and a lot of barracks and also contained prisoners from a lot of different nations. British were there, French were there, Russians were there, and now we were coming in to occupy a quadrant of that whole thing. There were about 1,200 American prisoners. Of the 1,200, I would estimate maybe 200 were Jewish. So there's about 240 men in the barracks. You were given one thin blanket. That was all you had. I'm standing on Main Street, uh, right here in Stalag 9A. The barracks are still here. People are living here, even today. It's, it's really hard to imagine that, that these barracks still stand almost intact the way that they were when Dad and his men were here. Men like Skip Friedman and Lester Tanner, Sonny Fox, Paul Stern. In Zingenheit in my barracks, Lester was in it, Paul was in it, Roddy was in it. We'd be talking to each other, not so much about combat, but what life was like back home. That's what we were living for. But the Germans needed more Jewish slave labor at the concentration camp at Berga. It was January 27, 1945, when the Germans announced that all Jewish American prisoners would fall out the following morning, just them. Anyone who didn't fall out would be shot. Same thing that they had said at Bad Oil. Only this time, we were organized. Roddy, for the first time in his experience, was in complete command. There was no one there to give him orders. It was his decision. He said, we're not gonna do that. Everyone is gonna fall out just as we do every morning. 
and Roddy was a very stoic guy, very solid guy, and uh, would take no garbage from anybody, and, and particularly Germans. <laughs> that following morning, Roddy is standing at the head of formation, and I was standing by his side. I was there, the German was there, and Lester was there. So I heard every word that the commandant said. Major Siegmund comes up to Roddy. He says, you can't all be Jewish. And Roddy says, we are all Jews here. That famous line, we're all Jews here, that will live in Jewish history. Siegmund got very red in the face. Someone which should defy him. You could see he was flustered. Takes out his luga and puts it next to Roddy's forehead. And he says, you will order the Jews to step forward or I will shoot you right now. And Roddy said to him, Major, you can shoot me, you can shoot all of us, but we know who you are. And this war is almost over and you'll be a war criminal. It was amazing with the gun to his head. I don't know how he managed to say that at that moment, but it saved his life and it saved our lives. And luckily for us, the German commander backed off. The Major lowered his Luca, about face, went back to his headquarters. And I was very proud and happy. But Roddy didn't want to talk about it. He would never have acted different. And he said, we are all Jews here. How would a Christian come out and say that? If only to protect them, to save them. He was truly a remarkable person. Yes, and he, a true Christian. It is entirely beyond me to measure the bravery of a man who at that risk to his life with nothing at stake for him, would have stood up like that. We came to admire him and respect him. So though when Roddy said something while we were prisoners, that was what we did. Throughout the winter, the Germans were systematically starving the American prisoners. Many of the men lost as much as a pound a day while they were in Stalag 9A. Some men lost as much as 80 pounds. In the morning, they would bring us what they called soup or tea. And it was just water. Dinner was a piece of bread. So it was probably half flour and half sawdust. We had 10 men sharing one loaf of ersatz bread. You went to bed hungry, you got up hungry, you were hungry forever. I lost 60 pounds in three months. I went from 180 to 120. This is a cover of Chesterfield cigarettes. We listed the foods we would like to have when we get home. All wonderful food was on our mind. There was one pot-bellied stove that occasionally put out heat, but most of the time didn't, and a outhouse in the back that was very, very cold. Now, the first thing that happens when you settle into being a prisoner, I find, is apathy. A sense of helplessness, a sense of, oh, there's nothing I can do. The days were grim. Some of the guys became morose, moody. And that was day by day. I was there a hundred days. But beginning in March, we suddenly had American airplanes overhead. BBC. This is Ian Wilson speaking from we were able to track the war pretty closely, even as we were POWs. In one corner of the prison camp was the French sector of POWs. Now, they had been there since the fall of France, so they'd been there for almost five years now. And in that time, they had rigged up somehow a radio. Supreme Headquarters announced a few minutes ago... Then we found out through the radio that the Americans were nearby. The Allies are across the Rhine. 
Troops under General Hodges... Is so we knew we were within days of being liberated, hopefully. The German commanders informed Roddy that they were going to evacuate the camp. They don't want to be around when the Americans come. They can't wait to get the heck out themselves. And under Roddy's leadership, we refused. And that's why I'm here to tell you about the story today. Roddy said, we're just too weak to go on a long march. We were in such lousy shape. The chances of coming out of that alive are not good. Nobody marches out of camp. You break ranks and you run back into the barracks. And you keep doing that all day. The day dawns, and in come the Germans. Raus, raus! Raus, getting up, going back and forth. Now the Germans are really getting miffed. And now they're starting to shoot guns into the air. Some of us were falling on the ground, and the two of us would carry us back into the back. All during that day, we would see the British, the French, the Russians marching out. Finally, they give up, the Germans. The German officers came up to Roddy and said, OK, <laughs> camp is yours. And they marched out. We were left alone in the camp. Finally, the old German colonel came down and threw up both hands and said we had won and could have the camp. He was leaving. It gets very quiet. So now I climb up, a few of us climb up on the roof of our barracks. And then we see two lines of tanks. The American tanks came in. The boys ran to the tanks, kissing the tanks. They were amazed to see these American soldiers, thin, hungry, were all over the tanks. It was such a happy day. We were liberated on March 30th which was the second day of Passover. The American Sherman tank had pulled up to the gate at Ziegenheim, and Les and I and Paul went out to greet it. Paul was smart enough to ask this tanker if he had any food. And the captain in that tank reaches down and pulls up some hard crackers and throws them to us. And Paul looks at it and says, told you we'd have matzo for Passover. And what a great way to celebrate the Festival of Freedom. And every time I ran a Seder, I would make this point because it was the date of my freedom. I've made new friends and lost some. I don't know whether all my boys are alive or not, but I pray that they are. GI trucks pull up to our camp, and the next thing you know, we are driven down the road to a town called Giessen. And Giessen was one of the biggest Nazi Air Force bases in Western Europe. And on that day, we flew from Giessen to La Havre. Well, they took us to Camp Lucky Strike, and I lost track of Roddy. And uh, I, I never saw him again after, after that day. And, but it was never out of my mind. I have to tell you, that experience and Roddy was a defining experience in my life. Roddy was incredible. He never really got his recognition, except among us. We were very lucky to have him with us. That such people can exist gives you hope, maybe, for humanity. We stood there, we were the witnesses. We were the witnesses. He was asked a question, gave the answer. We are all Jews here. Roddy Edmonds is the only U.S. soldier to be honored as righteous among the nations by Yad Vashem. Would we have the courage of Master Sergeant Roddy Edmonds? Faced with a choice of giving up his fellow soldiers or saving his own life, 
Roddy looked evil in the eye and dared a Nazi to shoot. His moral compass never wavered. He was true to his faith. And he saved some 200 Jewish American soldiers as a consequence. It's an instructive lesson, by the way, for those of us Christians. I cannot imagine a greater expression of Christianity to say, I too am a Jew. I've been following the footsteps of my father and it's led me here. What I've discovered is that uh, your choices and my choices matter. They not only matter for the moment, but they matter for history. The lives of 200 Jewish men were forever changed right here. It wasn't only my life. Our lives multiplied. I have four children. I have six grandchildren. I have two great-grandchildren. So I want to have 18 people that wouldn't be here without him. Multiply that by 200, and you can see how important that decision has been. That's the biggest joy for me, is to see the real people, the lives that have been touched and changed. I don't think he did it because we were Jews. He did it because we were his men. Roddy could no more have turned over any of his men to the Nazis than he could stop breathing. Just couldn't do it. A righteous man. Stanley, thank you for sharing the film with us. And we can all say that we know the producer of the film, Stanley Stahl. Uh, thank you. And we all know that our students are the future and their choices matter now and they will matter for the future. And I, I know we had one question in the chat from Doug Servi. Uh, Morgan, would you pose or uh, let Tug pose the question, please? Yes, Doug, you should actually be able to unmute yourself. Yeah, I, I did. Stanley, that's awesome. I've, for everybody that's watching this, do yourself a favor and show this film to your students. I've used it every semester since it's come out. You may want to read the book. Um, I've actually emailed uh, the son. He's very good about answering. Um, it's just an incredible film. And, and there's usually um, not a dry eye in the room as a result of this. Uh, Stanley, what's the current status of the Congressional Gold Medal? Uh, thank you, Doug. The best of my knowledge, it's not going anywhere. Pastor Edmonds is from Tennessee. He got the support of both senators. However, I believe there's another medal um, there's a Medal of Honor, and I think there is another medal that can be given by the Congress. So that might happen. Um, there are a group of us that are trying to get it. It is my understanding, and I hope I'm speaking correctly, that he was not given the Medal of Honor because he didn't say he didn't have a gun in his hands when he was doing it. They were prisoners of war. And, and I want to make a point 
he he saved the 200 there were 1292 american pow's 200 were jewish give or take approximately he saved the jews not just once but twice and he saved everyone once because when the brits the french and the russians went on the death march and you know about death marches when you when you look at the, the holocaust when the um, Germans uh, evacuated some of the uh, concentration camps, American POWs were put on death marches along with the Brits, the French, uh, the Russians. Many of those died on that death march. So the American POWs, the whole group, would, as you heard the POWs say, a number probably would have died on the death march, whether it was one day, two days, three days, as they marched deeper into Germany. So he saved a whole group of GIs, not once but twice. We, we, you know, so I know Pastor Edmonds is working on it, and uh, we've been doing this since the Obama administration, the very end of the Obama administration. So we we should probably contact our congressman or congresswoman. Yeah, I think senators. you could. You can. We can write to Chris. We can call. We can call Chris, Pastor Edmonds. Okay. Or, you know. He was trying to retire, but because of COVID, you know, uh, from his church activities. Um, but we can reach out to him and see the status. All right, thank you. Thank you all. We are going to um, keep to our schedule. So before I conclude, I would love uh, to ask Stanley if you would be our official concluder of today's workshop, and then I will be the unofficial concluder. How does that sound? Fine. Um, <laughs> I want to thank, first of all, I want to thank Professor Rosenthal and the fabulous staff at Stockton for uh, doing a starting this program dealing with uh, rescue and the hope that rescuers gave. And I want to thank each of you for, for giving up your time for those of us in the States, mostly in mourning, uh, to be with us. It is so good to meet you virtually. And if we can be of any help, please let us know. And you can contact me through Professor Rosenthal. And I think Morgan put my name on the, on the our, our information on the chat. So I wish everybody to be safe as we go through the, you know, the next few weeks with what's going on outside, uh, the COVID, uh, the Delta variant. So, so thank you, everyone. And I hope to see everybody tomorrow and the next day when you hear from amazing scholars. Thank you, Stanley. And I just have to do, uh, Irene, you have our phone number. Irene's asking a question in our chat and I'll just verbally say it. It's area code 609-652-4699. And we will explain to you uh, why we had to rearrange our schedule today. I see you're in Israel. So Irene, I will repeat again that we are going to do Betty Gerbinchikov's story, who was unable to come today to be with us in October. She asked us to postpone it because she had a scheduling conflict. That's why we did not cover the story of rescue with Shanghai, China. We did mention a little bit about it when we were talking about countries and that's why. So um, I'm sorry, but we had to postpone that portion because she had a conflict. As the last person to speak, thank you all because none of this would have happened, number one, without you, our teachers, number two, without our dual high school credit, Darren with his superstar students. Thank you. And we look forward to continuing our theme tomorrow about lessons of hope. And we're gonna be focusing more on faith tomorrow, faith during the Holocaust. And faith is linked with mutual assistance during the Holocaust being responsible for each other. Please complete the evaluations. They're so important to us. 
because Stanley and I both have the same policy. All of our programming to schools, all of our programming and programs are free and we need to share that with our major funders. Uh, those of you that came late for various reasons, our workshop seminar today was recorded. It will be available on our um, website and all of you will be receiving PDHs. And again, in the chat, we have my contact as well as uh, the phone, as well as email. Anything you wanna know from Stanley, you can send it to me. I will forward it on to you. And thank you all so much. And I hope to see so many of you tomorrow. Stanley, A plus, A plus. Thank you all, have a great day wherever you are. And thank you so much. It means so much to us um, joining us today. And our last plug for our Holocaust Center, we have an exhibition here open to students dedicated to the rescue of one family in the Netherlands. And the little boy who was saved was just several blocks from Anne Frank. His name is Leo Ullman. Leo is still with us today. He's available to your uh, students to meet with them virtually. And we have his uh, life story in a, a short book about 50 pages long on the fifth grade uh, reading level. And we encourage you, we have funding for buses, come on down, bring your students to that exhibition. And we wanna remind you that yes, we were highlighted on 60 Minutes on CBS because we have an interactive biography of a Holocaust survivor where your students can meet that survivor. Some of you call it a hologram, we call it an interactive biography that is also available to school groups when you come here and we will help you to prepare for that visit. Have a great day, uh, Stanley and I, and Irvin and Morgan, who we could not do any of this without them, Thank you, thank you, big time kudos are gonna begin the waving and we're gonna wave to all of you and we appreciate if you all wave back to us because then we feel connected. Put your cameras on just for the end so we can see you and we look forward to seeing you all again. And everybody cameras on, last time asking, give us a big wave, we love that. So we feel connected. Yes, thank you. And shalom, shalom, Leah Throat, to our friend Irene Gruber, who said, I'm in Israel. So hello to you. Bye, everybody. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow. You'll be receiving the evaluations and the PDHs very soon. Thank you all. Bye-bye.